If you grew up with white boys who only look at black and Puerto Rican porno Cause they want something that their dad don't got Then you know where you're at Mortaring your ear holes shut in a rush with wet coke In a Starbucks bathroom with the door closed on booze I'm left in residue and confused Like the first time you used soft water Down on my luck, caught unaware like Houdini when the last fist struck Sinking in, laughing at something sunken in I am If I'm sinking in, laughing at something sunken in I am If I'm sinking in, laughing at something sunken in I am Sucking dick for drink tickets at the free bar at my cousin's bat mitzvah Cutting the punchline and it ain't no joke Devoid of all hope, circus mirrors and pot smoke Picking fights on dyke night, at Shirley's and Lokes And snatching purses, doing out in a karaoke and forgetting all the verses Blowing kisses to disinterested bitches Playing lead lay in a bad way on Broadway Sending sexy SMSs to my ex's new man Cause I can, on the road trying to break an old band Eating pussy for new fangs I am, what the hell, using Purell Till my hands bleed and swell Missing mail at a Motel 6 I'm unwell If I'm sinking in laughing at something sunken in I am If I'm sinking in laughing at something sunken in I am If I'm sinking in laughing at something Something sunken and I am Feels exciting, touching your hand, writing, getting horny by reading it and repeating for me, intently staring at the picture of your feet on the sticker, at the art crumb exhibit, I wonder who's sicker, jerking off in an art museum, John, till my dick hurts, the kind of shit I won't admit to my head shrinker, not even in a whisper to my own little sister, I just stack like a dick and talk shit when I'm with her, all six, I say the Friday before Easter, it's not good, I cried to myself in the pisser and with you in the front row with the silver juice show me act like you didn't notice my fear of the bear that showed his pizza when i was six was overwhelming and not dissimilar to this sinking in laughing at something sunken in i am if i'm sinking in laughing at something sunken in i am if i'm sinking in laughing at something sunken in i am a Jacob hands on tour. I wake up hung over on a hardwood floor from a dream about how you dress. Hangs off for of your little breasts. I'd rather be dead than call this song how I lost your respect. But God bless her, get neglected. I bless her, get neglected. And I'll see you when the sun sets east. Don't forget me. Everybody, welcome to the program. Uh, for those of you that have listened to us for the past several weeks, you've probably heard me use the phrase bricolage, the French word, in some of the interviews that we've done. Uh, I remember talking with Lydia Yuknovich about it. This is a concept uh, that means bricklayer, right? And when used in literary studies and philosophical studies, it, it refers to someone who finds pieces of bricks, pieces of cultural artifacts laying on the ground, a crumbled wall. Uh, a structure and rebuilds it using the things that are laying around to make something new it, it's like quilting a little bit it's taking scraps of the previous and fashioning them into something useful um, for the modern eye for people can use it or see it in a new way something that's always been there but it's transforming and continuing the world the Greeks had a word for this the word was poiesis and it's the word that is the root for the modern for our modern word poetry and it was originally a verb and it literally was an action that meant to to transform or continue the world something that plato wrote extensively about uh the philosopher martin heidegger called poesis a kind of bringing forth 
using the term in its kind of widest sense, meaning that it was the the blossoming or the blooming of the blossom, the coming out of a butterfly from a cocoon, the the plummeting of a waterfall when the snow begins to melt, or things Heidegger would talk about. Um, so our poets have always been people that have fashioned things out of the old, have, have are the makers of things, the visionaries, those that take language and sound and movement to to show us ourselves in a new way, to show us the world in a new way, to help us see with new eyes, to re-vision, to revise the world. Our guest this week is a poet from the Phoenix area that I really enjoyed listening to his work. His stuff is funny and lighthearted, and yet it does what all good poetry does. It helps us see things anew, see things with fresh eyes. Shanti Orion is a person I think you're going to love listening to. He has a great delivery. He has a keen sense of observation. And he's one of those poets I love because he's a quote-unquote street poet. He, His eye, his sensibility doesn't come from the academy. It comes from riding buses and going to laundromats and sitting in cafes out in the uh, in the actual world that we live in. And so I find his work accessible, not pretentious, and, and really, really just delightful. I think you're going to love him. One other quick thing before we get to the show, we are on iTunes, but we've had a little bit of a glitch in terms of getting our logo and a few other things to cooperate, and so you might experience a disruption after this week's show where we're going to have to probably delete our iTunes account and resubmit it to get everything working function, uh, working and functioningly correctly. So. Just sit with us, sit tight with us, ladies and gentlemen. We uh, are a new program. We're getting all the bugs worked out, and our main objective is to deliver the show to you in a consistent way and a reliable way and something that gives you multiple access points. And so we're getting there, and we're on it. All right, I hope you enjoy this week's episode. It was a great one for us to record. It's a little different in structure than the previous ones. We spent half the time in interview with Shantae Orion, and then the other half going to Josh Lubin's wonderful Salon Skid Row event where Shantae was able to come read along with some uh, other wonderful readers for that night. So enjoy the program, folks. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome to On the Block with Andrew Gurevich, a podcast about authentic people doing beautiful things. Enjoy the show. like an hour and a half so maybe you can like edit down to like 30 minutes of interesting shit yeah i feel like that about my life i feel <laughs> yes. like if i live to be 80 i yeah. might get three years yeah. uh, worth of things that <laughs> i'm not horribly ashamed of yeah um or just aren't noteworthy in any uh sense of the imagination <laughs> yeah welcome yeah. to the program folks this is your host andy gervich my guest today is shantae orion where i just learned uh five minutes ago i've been mispronouncing your name sir for the past three days it's no big deal. I got over it right then. <laughs> Did you? Yes. Did I say it correctly that time? Absolutely. Shantae Orion attended Paradise Valley Community College for one day. You're welcome. Po- <laughs> What's that? You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, I want to get back to that. God bless you for that, by the way. Uh, but his poems have appeared in the Three Penny Review, Barrel House, Gargoyle Magazine, Georgetown Review, New York Quarterly, and many other journals. His chapbook, The Infernal Gaze, was published by Red Booth Review, and he has been invited to read and has read at bookstores, bars, universities, hair salons, museums, and laundro mats. Laundro mats? Yes. You're the poet, sir. Yes. Most people say laundry mats. That that is how they say it. And, you know, the other interesting thing is, you know, it's it's more like a proper noun, too, but um, I I don't like the way it looks like that, so... Yeah. I usually lowercase it anyway. <laughs> he host, oh, go it ahead. It might be one of those things kind of like Kleenex or something, you know, where you're just so used to using that as name for you like tissue. Yeah. Even if it's not Kleenex. Yeah, when a brand becomes like synonymous yeah. with the thing. So like when people say get a Coke yeah. or something and they yeah. could mean like anything. And they're like, oh, no. here's, here's a tab that they haven't made in like 25 years or something. <laughs> uh, I worked at a bar once. I'm in the middle of your bio, but... Who gives a shit? We'll, oh, get, yeah. we'll get to that. Uh, not who gives a shit about your bio. I'm just saying we'll get back to it. It's, <laughs> it's written down here. Um, 
I worked at a McMinimins and uh, we served RC Cola products. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> And the thing about that is, you know, we got they send reps around, right? And uh, and they'd sit at they'd sit down, and um, order a coke. They say I'll have a coke, and and if we brought them back the R, you know, an RC, because we go, I know what you mean. We'll bring you a cola. Then they'd get pissed and be like, God oh, damn it, you got to tell people it's RC and not coke. Where like they were undercover. <laughs> You're like entrapment. Yeah, <laughs> and it was kind of a you know royal crown. It's like an outfit. You know, it's a guy. He's in a suit. He's got a thing in his ear, and he's like working for the soda company. And they'd get they were very very clear about how we had to tell people it was RC products, right? So then, the other side of it is you get a customer who um who comes in and goes, I'll have a coke, right? And you go, Oh well, you know, you just got stung by the guy last week. And you go, uh, well, it's RC. And that customer has been coming to this McMinimins for, um, you know, maybe a couple of years. And they sit down and order a Coke and people just bring them an RC. But since we got busted, we got to now tell them. And it's now they RC. think you're just being but argumentative. They, but they go, I've been coming here five years and I drink Coke. And, and then you ha- and then now you got to explain to the guy, no, what I think happened, sir, is that the other people just brought you an RC. You don't think I know the difference between RC and Coke? And I go, well, sir, you know, with all due respect, I work here. I think I know what's on the gun. Let me see your manager, you know. And then it becomes this, and then the manager comes, and then it's apologized to the customer. And I go, but we don't have Coke, <laughs> right? And we just got yelled at by the RC dude. So, I mean, you've done shitty jobs, right? You've worked in food service. Have you been in this kind of hell? I have not Before. worked in food service. You have not. I, I did push shopping carts and bag groceries when I was younger. So that's that's you know it def, definitely qualifies into your shitty job spectrum. I feel like every system is a kind of pointless bureaucracy. Like I work in a college now, and it's filled with the same sorts of maddening, uh, illogical, you know, vortices. If that makes any sense. And well. In a sick way, that that comforts me to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> that at least you know maybe. I don't have to worry about having some lofty aspirations of getting some, you know, admirable job someday. And, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. when I grow up. <laughs> yeah, right. So let's get back to your bio. Sorry. You host a monthly poetry reading in Arizona, in Phoenix? Yes. Your book, The Existentialist Cookbook, your debut debut collection of poems? I would or say debut full book? collection. Yeah, there yeah. was a chat book that is just a small, small little selection, you know, like, 10 years before that. Um, but this is like the first full length book, the existentialist cookbook. My description says that this book sifts through the absurdity of modern living for scraps of philosophy, religion, and mathematics. Do you know Harold Bloom? Do you know his work, the author and podcaster? Just a little bit. Yeah. He seems kind of like a, uh, a more methed out version of you. Oh. If that makes any sense. <laughs> I hope uh, he doesn't hear that. I want to have him on the program. I mean that with all respect, Mr. Bloom. Th- that would be a great blurb for my next book. Yeah. Like, uh, a <laughs> a methed out, or, you know, a yeah. less methed out yeah. version of Harold Bloom. Of Harold huh? Bloom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you can have that, me to you. <laughs> um, to blend into recipes. So let me start that again. The Existentialist Cookbook. Shante Orion sifts through the absurdity of modern living. For scraps of philosophy, religion, and mathematics to blend into recipes for elegies and celebrations. From Kurosawa films to Project Runway, writers to rock stars, influences are embraced and wrestled as Orion magnifies mortality through the prism of chronology and humor. So, that's quite a mouthful. It's, uh, I want to know a little bit about your origins. So, you, did you grow up in Arizona? I did grow up there, but I wasn't born there. I was born in Boulder, Colorado. Okay. And then my mother kind of hitchhiked with me on a papoose around the country and all kinds of weird places, uh, you know, down in Florida, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a, a little r- religious commune in upstate New York, a little island off of Maine, um, all kinds of bizarre places like that. There were times where we were living in a teepee in, a, in uh, on some land that our friends owned so there were all kinds of experiences like that and then when it was time when i got about old enough to start school that's when she came back to arizona because she had family there and she wanted me to have a more settled life for that kind of thing so your dad wasn't in the picture no not really no um she left from him when she didn't realize she was pregnant Mm -hmm. and it wasn't until months later and uh so so yeah, I I grew up without without a dad. 
Is that uh, is that a person you've ever connected with, really, or established any kind of relationship with? I did eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, she always she always told me, you know, who he was, and you know, she said nothing but good things about mm -hmm. him, and said that, you know, if, if you ever want to meet him, just let me know. Cause, you know, he's, he's a great guy, and you know, I would set you up. But at the young age, I didn't really want to get involved in any kind of like weird, like you know, cross family dynamic mm -hmm. kind of thing, and. Uh, you know, I didn't really want to like show up like like I need something or I want something. Yeah. And so I kind of wanted to wait until I was old enough to where it seemed like I was maybe a little bit more settled into my own life. And that's interesting. And then you know it it was almost like okay then for me to 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 meet him because I was definitely curious and I would like to know and I mean but I kind of wanted to wait until you know I was like living on my own. You know, had a little shitty job that you know paying bills and all that kind of stuff. And so then I was like, hey, you know I. I would like to to meet him now, and and so at that time she tried to find him, but then the it was so long the trail was cold. Oh man, she. So could you not were like older, him. older. You were like eighteen. Uh, I was probably in the early twenties at okay. that point. Yeah. You know? Um. And so at that point, you know, just it was too long. Could not find him. It was. Uh, she even hired a private investigator at one point. Wow. And just couldn't get anywhere, and so then just uh, you know it took a long time. You. My wife and I it would just check in certain days because, you know, the Internet was kind of becoming more and more of a thing at that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So every few years we would check in to see what we could put together and, and eventually tr tracked him down when I was about 29 years old. No oh, shit. And he was like, hey, I'm glad you found me. I, you know, you got to come, come see me. I live over here in Maui and, you know, you should come visit. All right, yeah, sure, we could do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe if he was living in Missouri, we might never have met. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, well, come see me. I live in Missouri. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of busy. I'm, I'm, <laughs> 20, I'm 29 now. I got this far. Yeah. So at that point, you know, I did get to meet him. And you know, at that point, that was even more than I, I was expecting or hoping for at that point. Because I was almost resigned to the fact that, you know, I'm probably never going to find this guy. Yeah. Find this guy. I'm never going to meet him. Did and, you ever wonder so as a great. kid... I mean, so when your mom says, hey, if you ever have the desire to meet him, did you ever wonder, like, does this guy have the desire to meet me and find me? Like, where is he? Why Why isn't my dad coming to track me down? Well, I, I really wasn't sure if he even knew that I was that yeah, I was out there. So I, yeah. I really didn't know if, if he knew that I was around anywhere. Yeah. So, so this, uh, this upbringing where you're bouncing around a lot, was that something... You know, I've met a few people that have had that were raised in that environment and they have different responses. Do you, yeah. do you feel that was traumatic? Do you look it, fondly in that time period? A little bit of It both? was not traumatic for yeah. me. Uh -huh. um, I, I think looking back, you know, there was a lot of experiences that I got to like take in and you know, it, it helped me in a lot of ways in the end. Um, you know, just a lot of interesting things that would go on there. And one of the ways that affected me, though, I think maybe – Bouncing around like that as a kid, you know, you're, you're kind of like, you get into that mold of like constantly feeling like maybe like outsider or mm -hmm. you're like, you're like this new person. And, um, you know, so even once we did finally settle down, I don't know if I really ever got out of that kind of mentality, you know, so I always kind of felt like that, but it probably helped me in a way where maybe I was still looking at things with like a tourist's eye, no matter how many, how long I would live in Arizona, mm -hmm. maybe I'm still kind of looking at it you know, as, as a visitor. <laughs> I, my, my dad was in, I've talked about this on the show before. My dad was in the mafia and we moved around every couple of years, a, a, a similar kind of carny lifestyle, but for uh, different reasons. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I've always felt like the kind of outsider in every town that I was in, even still in Portland, because I just bounced around so much. And what the, the question I have is I, you know, I see how that drew some neural pathways in me early on that translate into my curiosity with the world and my desire to be able to understand and get along with and interact with different kinds of people. Even the genesis of this show is me trying to sit down with a lot of different kinds of people. I mean, we had a guy on, he, it, the episode hasn't aired yet, well, depending on when your episode airs, but um, Mark Schultz, who's a world champion uh, uh, wrestler and UFC fighter, and, you know, it couldn't be more different than me and we, you and most of the kinds of guests we normally have on. And my ability and desire to talk to this kind of wide variety of people came from my childhood, came from the fact that my, we moved so much and interacted with such different kinds of people. And I'm wondering, 
um, I see a direct connection to what you've already just said about your that limited period of time and what I know about your poetry, which we're going to get to in a second. There's some early pathways drawn that maybe influence this poet's eye that developed a little bit later. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that what most of us start out as in those formative years, mm -hmm. you'll spend the rest of your life and not really be able to shake that completely. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you really don't stray far from the mentality that you start, start out with. So when did you start writing? I was maybe dabbling a little bit in later years of high school, but I really didn't start focusing until my early 20s. I think I, I really started narrowing down and focusing on writing more. And, and was it immediately poetry or did you? Yes. Start, yes, really. Yes. Right away. I think in part because of my attention span. I would love to tackle a large project or be, you know, some esteemed novel writer, but I, I, I tend to see things in broken down bits. I like to focus on the minutia mm -hmm. of the world. And so you started writing poems immediately. Did you, I mean... Was it to get chicks? Like what? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, Come on. I, I think in part it's because it made the most sense of everything that I had been experiencing and dabbling with up to that point. It was an outlet for those yeah. kind of things in a way that nothing else satisfied. And you, when you finally stumble onto something that you're you're actually kind of proud of or that mm -hmm. you like. Uh, you know, it can can get maybe uh, you know addicting. Like you you want to experience that again sometimes. So you know you're you're on this quest to write something else that is going to lead to that kind of feeling that you know that like fleeting success or something that you know you're you're proud of how that came out, how you were able to shape that. How did you know? Did you get good feedback from teachers? How did you know that um, this was something? More than just, you know, jotting some poems down that was a hobby or something. Like, lots of people write poetry in journals and stuff, and most of it's terrible. When did yeah. you... Was it was it your stuff immediately? Did you have a style immediately, or were you doing... Did you study poets? No, like my, my, my style definitely evolved mm -hmm. over the years, and I didn't have any teachers at that moment because I wasn't going to college right. or anything. Um, so it was more like I was trying to write the kind of poems that I would want to read. Mm-hmm. And so mm. that was that was basically what it boiled down to. I would try to write something that I would find interesting if I encountered it on a page. So you didn't uh, do anything mimetic. You didn't like read the poetry of you know of E. e. Cummings or, or something, and then say, "I want to I want to oh, follow this." No, I mean uh, absolutely. Yeah. I was yeah. reading whatever I could. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 that that's an essential element. I you know I would read. Who were those? Who were those early influences? Well, you they know, don't have to be just poets. Yeah, but, no. Yeah. Uh, um, well, yeah, there were. Yeah. That's the main thing. A lot of my influences were not poets, yeah, absolutely. but in the poetry world, you know, absolutely. You know, you're reading E.E. E. Cummings mm -hmm. when I was a child, T.S. Eliot, mm -hmm. uh, Basho, and um, the the one that was the primary influence was a French poet named Jacques Prévert. Okay, and we would use his poems in my high school French class to translate and work with the language. But I, w I was so enamored with the way that our class could spin off into these gigantic philosophical and historical discussions based on these little tiny poems that I think that really laid the groundwork for a lot of what I tried to do later on. Uh, we're going to take our first break. This is Andy Gervich. You're listening to On the Block Radio. Our guest is the poet Shante Orion. We'll be back in a minute. You've been listening to On the Block, a podcast for bonobos only. No chimps allowed. Be right back. Green light. Hey girl, school zone. I'm getting hungry. Car changing lanes. You want to meet me for pizza? Stop sign. Intersection clear. Yeah, street. Pizza sounds good. Ball in street? Girl in street! <gasps> it's hard to concentrate on two things at once, like texting and driving. Stop the text, stop the wrecks. How will you stop texting and driving? 
Tell us at stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. All right, welcome back to the program, everybody. This is On the Block Radio. This is your host, Andy Gervich. We are sitting with Shantae O'Ryan. When we left for the break, we were discussing when you first were writing poetry, and you said you really got into this seriously in your early 20s. Yes. Um, When you started writing, when did you get the the hint that something was going on here that might be worth, you know, becoming a career or sharing with the world or reading two people? I mean, was that instantaneously? Did that take time? Well, there was never, even to this moment, any <laughs> any <laughs> inclination that it would ever be a career. Yeah. Because <laughs> who the yeah, hell makes money writing books yeah, of poetry? I, yeah. I was never delusional. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's hard to remember so long ago, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, I think just gradually you'd write something, and that you know things got a little bit better and a little bit better. And at that point, a lot of the the desire and the ambition is to write a few decent things that can help bury the shit that you've been re- writing for the last two years. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. you keep trying to like write better stuff so that you can slowly bury all that stuff that you were starting out with. And uh, that was the way that the latter worked for me. Yeah. Well, you know, you said something a second ago or, uh, before the break about wanting to write the poems, writing poems that you would like to see, right? That yes. you would want to read. And uh, we had a guest on, Wendy Froud, who's called the mother of Yoda. She's the, the, the puppeteer who fabricated the Yoda doll and helped Frank Oz work the puppet in Empire Strikes Back. Her and her husband also did all the puppetry and artwork for Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. And she became a doll maker for the exact same reason. She was a little kid and wanted to play with dolls that didn't exist. And so she started making them to kind of satisfy her own curiosity. She didn't merely think she was going to sell them or make a career. She just made dolls that she wanted to play with. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly how. And you know, the word poiesis, as you know, probably I'm sure as a poet from the Greek, means to make or to create. And the, the root of the word is, you know, a poem is a made thing, right? It's a creation. In the 18th century romantic poets, um, you know, Shelley and Byron and Coleridge and uh, and these guys said, you know, uh, would get a little grandiose and say and said that the poets are sort of like gods. And it was um, the rape of the lock. And so Alexander Pope, uh, I don't know if he have you read this poem, the rape of the lock. So a wealth, two wealthy families, they were having a garden party and uh, uh, one guy um, went to the to the young maiden of the other family and snipped the lock of her hair when she wasn't looking and then went around telling people that he slept with her and the proof was that he had this lock of hair. Kind of weird, kind of creepy, kind of mean, but not, at the end of the day, white people problems, right? And it was these extremely two wealthy families. And so one of the families hired Pope to write a poem about this event to try to immortalize the crime and vindicate the girl. And in the poem, he basically trivializes the people. He he writes it as like it's this it's like this Rome it's like Ovid, right? He writes it as this massive epic, but the entire time he's mocking the people and saying your trivial little stupid lives don't mean anything, but I as a poet will make them mean something, right? Like the greatness here is in my ability to turn your insignificant event into something that will be immortal, but the immortal aspect of it comes from the poem. Now these guys were a little megalomaniacal, but I do think the idea of a poet as as a one as one who m- creates these artifacts is a fascinating thing. Do you, do you see where I'm going with this? I mean, like, I see where you're going a little bit, but it's it's hard for me to relate to that level of me. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This sure. is definitely 18th um, century England. You know, and what do you? So why are you a poet? What do you see yourself doing in in these things? Is it purely self expression? Are you trying to say something to people in your work? Well, I I will say when it comes to that, mm-hmm. I don't concern myself a whole lot with thinking of how many centuries this poem might last for. <laughs> I have no concern for that at all. Yeah, a legacy My, poet. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, I I put a lot more importance on like the immediate connection between people and like especially at a a poetry reading Mm -hmm. 
I think especially in, in this day and age when so many people are distracted and drowning in distractions at every moment, you know, whether it's their you know Facebook or their Twitter or the text messages they're getting from their, mm-hmm. their friends, and to have people in the same room and to be able to suddenly make them stop checking their phone and you're all kind of together in that moment on this poem, like there's a special electricity that happens and, and that's more important to me than, you know, whether these poems will mean something to anybody next year hmm. or the next <clears throat> decade or anything. And the subjects of your poems, and I want to get to those in a second. Um, do you, do you take on issues of, of politics and social justice and these kinds of things or what, what are your observations Every once in a while, but yeah. I don't set out to try to do anything mm-hmm. with the poem. I I'm just try I try to be open to whatever, like, lights a little fire in my imagination. You know, whatever kind of like you know stands out that I can't stop thinking about. That's what I'm gonna do. And so sometimes that is politics. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that is you know a social issue. Sometimes it's you know just more. You know what's going on down the street, around the corner. You know that the theme of our show is um, authentic people doing beautiful things, and the kind of general idea is I'm interested in transformation. I'm interested in people that take something that is either trauma based, like having had a terrible experience in life, um, and transforming it into something meaningful and beautiful, or people that take the seemingly um, innocuous or the mundane and swirl it around a little bit and help us to see it a little differently. And that's, that's what I love about your work. That's more the area that I, that I de- deal with. You had a poem that I heard the other night and maybe um, in our breaks when we have you do a couple of pieces, you, you might perform this one for us about um, waiting for a chicken salad sandwich. And that poem communicates more to me about some of the frustrations of living in the modern world than maybe... 10 Noam Chomsky books. <laughs> and I really mean that. Yeah, and I really mean that. Um, and so I, I want to ask you a little bit about not going the academic route because you were part of kind of an artist collective in Phoenix. Is that right? Yeah, I would say so. With Jessica I, I, yeah, and Jonathan. With a lot of people. I, mm-hmm. I was very involved in the art scene, many different types. And mm-hmm. to go back to what you were saying about authentic yeah. people, um, like one of the big influences for me was music, you know, Mm -hmm. growing up and everything. And then fortunately, uh, I had a friend that got me into a lot of the local music scenes too. So I I would go to a lot of these local shows and I found out that there were just some wonderful, incredible bands going on. And and the thing that really stood out to me is that sometimes I would go into this shitty little venue for maybe like $5 or whatever the cover was, and there'd be one of these local bands that I, I actually liked a lot that were very talented and committed. And there might be like seven people in that crowd, but yet you knew you were seeing something that was so authentic and real that it was probably more authentic than whatever was going on at the stadium downtown at that given moment with whatever pop star was in there. And I, I appreciated the way that they were that dedicated to, to give you the show that the best show that they could in that moment, no matter how small potatoes it might seem. And so I always try to carry that over when I go to do a reading or something, you know, I want people to walk out of there. You know, if they just came into some, you know, weird little venue, probably didn't pay anything to get in, but you know, I hope they walk away feeling like they saw something that was every bit as authentic as any poetry reading that's going on you know, at whatever humongous bookstore or, or college or campus, college or, campus, yeah, all or theater. that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to ask you more about that because, um, you know, we're doing a, at the college that I work, uh, where I work, uh, where we have a series called the mouths of others, where we bring people to campus for various readings and stuff. And, and this year we're bringing a group called sister outsider, uh, which is a slam poetry team to women, uh, Dominic Christina, and Denise Froman, and when they're internationally renowned, won the Slam International Slam Poetry Contest like six years in a row. They're just phenomenal, I think, and so does pretty much everybody else. And and for the most part, the school and the department and the committee has been very supportive. But then there's some folks that have been pushing back on it, and they've been pushing back on on it under the auspices of this notion that it's not real poetry, 
right? That it's sort of not refined enough to, it's not academic enough. It doesn't come from sort of within the channels that we recognize. And I work at a community college. Uh, um, and so it's not, we can't, it's not really acceptable poetry. It's kind of something that people do out there. It's pretty elitist. And I'm wondering, have you encountered that? Like being somebody who's not coming out of the academic world? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Something that there's a sort of, if you have, you know, an MFA after your name, then somehow that means you're going to be a better poet. Now you actually know that that's not the case. That has nothing to do with the authenticity or the immediacy or the power of somebody's work. And yet there's this air of sort of authority that comes along with having emerged from within the institution as as opposed to existing on the side of it yeah um you know to go back to you know a lot of the musical influences yeah. when i was young yeah carry it over you know, like i remember at the time there would be these people like steve Vai, mm -hmm. who could just you know shred these guitars with all kinds of crazy scales and skill and mm -hmm. it was stuff that you could never ever even imagine doing and that meant nothing to me yeah <laughs> it, it, it affected me in no way whatsoever yeah um and then there'd be like these bands that would come up these people that weren't that technically skilled you know it, like the term would be like functional musicians mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they would you know, be able to latch on to this kind of creative electricity and so someone like a, a band like nirvana or something mm -hmm. they could be playing some chords that you could probably learn in a few days or something but but you couldn't come up with the the way that that you know it would resonate with you like it was it was this on this pure level that it would affect me more than you know whatever any kind of technically brilliant player was playing out there and so i always try to remember that mm -hmm. when i'm writing where for me it's less about you know the kind of technical school chops that someone's bringing to this page and more about trying to latch on to things that that can come across and resonate from one human to the next. Is that why, like, you do things like a flash poetry reading at a laundromat or something just to try to go to places where poetry's not read? And Absolutely. To people that haven't come to be a part of a formal poetry I, event. I feel like that's that's me. That audience mm -hmm. is, is me out there. You know, I'm just a regular person who you know, work some job. Yeah. You know, I, I might be at this art gallery at Howard or you know, doing this, and... You know, I can appreciate a lot of poets. And I think that maybe a lot of these people out there, although they're not coming out to hear poetry tonight, I think if they encounter it, they might appreciate a lot of the, these poems more than they would ever expect to. And so I like the idea of trying to win over a crowd like that. I like getting to go and read to people that had no intention to come see poetry that night. And maybe you might have a few of them walking away change, with a changed mind and and maybe they might be a little bit more open to some of those experiences in the future. Yeah, and, you know, the the poet... Um, so I'm really talking to you about two different things, and I want to, you know, we're, uh, we, we don't have endless time, unfortunately, with you tonight. Uh, we're going to be heading off to a reading of yours soon, but uh, I want to move from questions about the writing of poetry to the delivery of it, because you have a very kind of special delivery that our audience is going to hear uh, later on in the piece when they hear you, or in our episode when they hear you perform. But... Before we get to that, I just want to say one thing in uh, in relation to what we've been talking about. The poet, going back to the romantics again, the, the poet Percy Shelley, not the band, the romantics, unfortunately, um, but we can talk about them too. Uh, he said that something along the lines of that a poem is that, that what the real poem is is the experience. That yes. a poet has an experience. Yes. You're sitting on a bus and like something happens or something happens in here or something happens out there or something happens as a combination. I'm pointing to my head as if the audience knows what the fuck I just did. That's hilarious. Um, so something happens in our internal world or the external world or some combination of each. And then that's the poem, that flash of experience, that lightning bolt. And then you reach for a pen and you write this thing down in language. And what that, what that poem is, is this kind of fading ember. Right, the poem is the exp the flash of experience, and then this, the, and then there's a secondary thing, which is something we write down, that tries to capture that experience in a way that when it's read to another person, they can also have a glimmer of what it felt like to be in that moment, seeing the world through your eyes. Is that do you do you Abs agree with that as a definition of poetry? 
I think there are many definitions yes. of poetry, and I think that's as legitimate as any other one. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I was in high school and a teenager and I was stuck in my room in some bland little neighborhood <laughs> and, you know, I discovered foreign films and I was really into all these foreign directors and I would see these Japanese films by Akira Kurosawa or these Swedish films by Imar Bergman and I would be able to experience all these things in these other cultures even from my own little bedroom in that room. And so... Yeah, I think that kind of leads into what you're saying about trying to communicate an experience being the most essential thing for me. Now, I want to ask you about your delivery before we we close this part of the conversation. Um, You know, as somebody who is is a professor and who does readings in town and who goes to a lot of readings, uh, both here and abroad, um, I've, I've seen authors who write amazing things who can't read their own material live like they can't they're not good readers of their own work i've seen people who've um who deliver amazing who uh um, oratory in front of people who are very good in terms of speaking in front of people but they've written rubbish (laughs) but they sound good in front of people um it's rare to find somebody i'm going i'm stroking your ego here who sort of does both who writes well and then delivers it well but they're really two separate skills are they not the writing of the poem and the delivery of the poem are very, very different. What is your process? Do you Definitely. say them out loud? And, well, then? and I didn't start out in that, that way at all. Yeah. I started out just being a poet who thought that he would hate poetry readings. I didn't go to any. I, I never read anything out loud. I, I just wanted to exist on the page. I, I kind of felt like that's where it was pure. and that's where, All that kind of bullshit yeah. that, that those people, people do. And then it wasn't until... I finally went out to one after my first chapbook was published. And then I, I, I saw some readings, and they weren't as horrible as I was expecting. And I actually ran into some people that were doing really great things live. And so it op- started opening my own possibilities. And from that point on, I started trying to synthesize the elements that I appreciate in live readings mm-hmm. and the elements that I appreciate on the page. And, and that's where I was trying to get those things to work together. Did that change your writing? Big time. Because when I encounter your poetry from the little bit that I had, I almost feel like it has to be heard. Like, you know what I mean? I I, I think that there's such an element of the performance of it that, not not that reading it, I'm not telling people to not get the book, right? What I'm saying is is that there's such an element that comes across. And so do you try to write them in a way where people reading the book will still get that intensity? I'm focused on the page while I'm writing. So okay. I'm, I'm just trying to write it the best way that I can. So you that. don't write them with an ear to how it's going to sound? No. Oh, no. fascinating. My, the, the page has its own voice, mm-hmm. and so when I go to read, I just try to let that come through. To me. So and, after you've written it, then you look at it and say, how am I going to read this? Uh, no, I don't really have to because it's, it's just written in my own voice anyway in my okay. head. So okay. this is how I would talk and how I would – how I would deliver it. Fascinating. Um, but, you know, there are some poems that I know won't quite work as well. And so there are some poems that I don't really read right. out very often. Shantae Orion, thank you so much for sitting with us. Thank you. For this part of the program. Uh, you're listening to On the Block Radio. We are going to go to break. When we come back, we will be hearing a variety of things. We're going to hear some poems from Shantae, and then we're going to be live at a reading at Josh Lubin's Oh, uh, Skid Row. Salon Skid Salon Row. Salon Skid Row at the Corner Bar in downtown Portland. So stay tuned, folks. We'll be back in a moment. Thank you for listening to On the Block. Free radio that's worth twice what you paid for it. More after this. We love our local poets, but we love our touring poets as well. So I want to tell you a little bit about this gentleman. I had the pleasure of uh, sharing the stage with him on Sunday, and he's super funny. He's super awesome. Uh, Shanti Orion attended Paradise Valley Community College for one day. His first book of poetry, The Existentialist Cookbook, was published by 
uh, NY Q Books. Is that right? Okay, good. Um, I've been doing this thing where I need to actually print this stuff out, so I had to revert back to this. So I, I apologize if I fumble on the small type. Uh, he is a former Copper State, uh, Cooper State Haiku Slam champion, and his poems have appeared in the Three Penny Review, Barrel House, Gargoyle Magazine, New York Quarterly, and other journals. He lives in Arizona, where he has performed at bookstores, bars, universities, hair salons, museums, and laundromats. He has a book here for sale as well, so please say hello to him after the reading and check out the merchandise he has. In the meantime, please give a big warm warm round of applause to our visiting poet from Arizona, Shanti Orion. Thank you so much for letting me be on this bill tonight, Josh. Infinite thanks. So let's just get right to a poem. This is called Him Latte. Though I've never acquired its taste, I pray to coffee as others pray to God. Please grant me the strength to endure this eight hour shift, to stay awake late enough to experience a night worth regretting. Please don't let me doze behind the wheel during the drive home lullaby or not off during conversation. Though I've never acquired its bitter taste. So I can only swallow that hollowed caffeine diluted in cocoa or caramel. But I still believe. I know you're there, listening to my prayers beneath clouds of whipped cream, steamed milk, dogma, and hazelnut, dark roast gospel translated from Irish cream into French vanilla, sacred scones baptized in espresso holy, mocha chino, shrouded in sugar, foam faith blessed with cinnamon, amen. <laughs> This is called Dear Wife's Panties. <laughs> Being fragile myself, I understand that it must be traumatic. Getting flung into the Bermuda vortex of a washing machine, but clinging for dear life to the Velcro pocket of my cargo pants <laughs> will only make everything worse for both of us. <laughs> this is a poem called Mallville. With his kindergarten haircut and conspicuous plastic eyeglasses obscuring the geometry of his cheekbones through non-prescription lenses, Clark Kent is a super hipster. Grew up in Kansas, but he was born someplace else. You've probably never been there. He liked the design on his chest before it became the letter S, back when it was just symbolic faster than an Instagram upload, more powerful than a Thursday afternoon hangover, able to leap to conclusions in a single snark, but downplays all abilities and superpowers, so you can't tell if he's underachieving. <laughs> Uses supersonic hearing to listen to unsigned garage bands pitchforks never heard of. X-ray vision framed by plastic non-prescription eyeglasses. The man of irony has a weakness for radiant minerals and a fetish for capes. Thinks Green Lantern sold out. Doesn't rely on fossil fuels. His mode of transportation leaves no carbon footprint. Built his fortress of solitude completely off grid. Still romanticizes newsprint. Prefers steampunk technology. The man of iron alloy. Ignores your Skype and text message. Please for help. 
unless he stumbles upon a vintage phone booth. <laughs> Sand witch craft. The only way to convey how long I waited for this chicken salad sandwich to arrive at my table is to keep in mind that I ordered an egg salad sandwich. But anything you order from Josh will be here in a hurry, as you can see from these tables here. So please support the bar. Uh, this poem is called The Amazing Technicolor Dream Poem. In chapter 37 of Genesis, Joseph reached the age of 17 before his 11 brothers conspired to murder him. Out of jealousy for the coat of many colors, their father gave him as a gift. Not because it signified that Joseph was obviously Jacob's favored son, but because even the first tie-dye garment known to man was tacky enough to provoke immediate homicidal contempt. <laughs> and those acid flashback hallucinations he tried to pass off as prophetic dreams only fanned the groovy flames of their hatred, sealing his own free-loving fate. Now, tie-dye is for anyone too indecisive to settle on a favorite color. Tie-dye convinced your parents that the most individualistic and countercultural thing they could do was to dress exactly like everyone else who was trying to be different. Tie-dye is far out, but even farther within, man. Tie-dye is the reason Supreme Court justices, hot goth girls, and Batman wear black. Tie-dye never gets invited to a royal wedding. Tie-dye is the reason brides wear ivory. Tie-dye has caused chameleons to spontaneously combust. Tie-dye is responsible for high school dropouts. Suddenly becoming passionate enough about the intricacies of chemistry to study and research how dye molecules form covalent bonds to cellulose-based fibers such as cotton, wool, and hemp by simply raising the pH with a little sodium carbonate. Man. Tie-dye made the Beatles tune in, made Bob Dylan plug in, made Jimi Hendrix check out. Tie-dye is the reason Johnny Cash wore black. Tie-dye is the hippie rainbow deadheads follow to find where that nine-fingered leprechaun hid his pot of pot. <laughs> tie-dye is for high school dropouts for whom running a meth lab is just way too complicated. Rock phlebotomy. This year's mosquito finds the skin beneath cotton, bites through corduroy. This year's mosquito has evolved to penetrate denim. But this year's mosquito doesn't know that I got a new tattoo within the past 12 months, that I've been having unprotected sex, that I vacationed in the Falkland Islands in 1993 and my veins are conduits for hypertension. This year's mosquito doesn't know that he is now blood brothers with every bed bug with whom I've ever shared a motel. I've read in a lot of really weird and cool venues but this is a first for me, and this is awesome. I, I knew when I walked in and they were playing Jean Cocteau's Le Sang d'un Poète that I was in the right place. And so, exactly. <laughs> but this goes back a little farther than that. It's called, When Asked What Kind of Cult I Grew Up In. 
It was the kind of cult secluded in the woods, isolated from neighbors and sin. The kind of cult that believes Saturday is the new Sunday and it should start on Friday night. The kind of cult that believes death is a sleep where you dream of nothing, but the wicked get a snooze button for an extra millennium. The kind of cult that believes Jesus will return on October 22nd, 1844. <laughs> the kind of cult that could be wrong. The kind of cult that spawned extremist offshoot cults of vegetarians, Branch Davidians, and breakfast cereals. The kind of cult that needed my mother to sew handmade extensions onto the bottoms of felt dresses worn by little felt women on the felt pages of my activity book so I wouldn't be seduced by impure desires. But I had already found salvation in the flesh of real ankles attached to the legs of real women, legs that could be felt all the way up to heaven. Yeah. Josh had us start a round of haiku the other night when we were doing it. So I'll do a few haiku here. This is called uh, Great Moments in Feminism Haiku. I hate when sexist Frat douchebags objectify babes like that one bitch. <laughs> um. <laughs> Little altar boy, show us on this crucifix where the priest touched you. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Wait, um. Happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas, except that syphilitic rash. <laughs> Failed intervention. Mom addicted to Botox. Raises no eyebrows. <laughs> Harry Potter's scar. Inflicted in utero. Coat, hanger, scratches. <laughs> Almost Googled porn, but left that for tomorrow. Procrasturbation. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the classy stuff, okay? <laughs> Not everything in this book is that horrible. The rest of it is worse. Um, this is called Kentucky Freud Chicken. Do you subconsciously desire a taste of your mother's thigh or breast meat? Would you like your soda id, ego, or super ego sized original recipe transference? I bear resemblance to your dead father. So you are only ordering a vanilla milkshake because you think I want you to order a vanilla milkshake. <laughs> Would you like a side order of cocaine? Potatoes are mashed and repressed with Rorschach splatters of gravy. I assume you meant coleslaw when you asked if the meal comes with cold sore. Porn on the cob was a similar slip of the tongue. Eleven herbs and childhood traumas. You only demand to speak to my manager because of your hatred for your father. Greasy buckets of buffalo hot wings represent your flightless dreams, your inability to escape. I do want you to order a vanilla milkshake. <laughs> so I can watch your puckered mouth struggle to suckle sips through the end of a straw, a tiny, inadequate straw. <laughs> All right, just a few more. Uh, this one, this one is sold. It doesn't even matter anymore. So I'll read it here. 
Um, it was written way back for like the 2008 election. Um, so before most of you were born, I think, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm a poet. I'm not good at math. So this is called... Oh. Barracuda. <laughs> if Sarah Palin drowns in an earmarked pet project cauldron filled with a mixture of freshly drilled Arctic National Wildlife Refuge oil and polar bear blood, then she was not a witch. And I will stand corrected. <laughs> Even if it was real, global warming could never thaw her heart. She knows that you can put lipstick on a 17-year-old girl who has been deprived of comprehensive sex education, but your NRA lobbyist will only have nine months to arrange the shotgun wedding. Those go-go boots helped pray away my gay and made the creationism of her bridge to nowhere into a $398 million catwalk worth every penny. She knows that if Alaskans weren't meant to be pale, they would live somewhere other than Alaska someplace exposed to more than five hours of daylight during winter months. So installing that tanning bed in the governor's office was a task from God. John McCain is the only dinosaur she believes in. She can see Uncle Ted's seven felony convictions from her house. She knows that presidential elections are glorified beauty pageants and not having any answers for important questions makes you a maverick. She understands and emphasizes homeland security, vows to protect America's prosperity like a clever Yahoo email password. She will fight Alaskan gray wolves over there, chasing and shooting them from the safety of helicopters so we won't have to fight them over here. And Sarah Palin knows that if books weren't meant to be burned, they would be made of something other than paper a flame-retardant material able to withstand the friction of contradictory ideas, the heat of dissent. She knows that if books weren't meant to be burned, they would not contain inflammatory ideas. All right, so these last three short poems are kind of go together, kind of like a series of costume poems, my like tributes to some of the poets I love back home. This first one is called Dogma, or Poem Yet to be Written by Patrick Hare. A thorough investigation revealed that the ruckus outside my kitchen window was being caused by two Jehovah's Witnesses in the front yard giving a meaty ham bone to my German shepherd. Not bound by Jehovah's commandments, I walked down the driveway and gave them two lies. How I deeply appreciated their generosity, because today was my dog's birthday. This one, <laughs> this one is called uh, Eight Proof Path to Enlightenment, or poem yet to be written by Dogo Barry Graham. Bringing light to a dark corner of the bar, the Buddha sits patiently, waiting for the waitress to bring another pitcher of beer. All around him, patrons are drinking to their health, to their sorrows, drinking to their worldly attachments. Exchanging miseries and failures they can only express when intoxicated. But the Buddha is aware that he is already drunk. He has always been drunk and doesn't need any alcohol to prove it. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here tonight. If anyone is interested in a book, I have some. They're like $15.00. But even if you don't want to buy one, feel free to come. Like, if you want to, like, browse through anything to see if it's worth putting on your Amazon or Goodreads list, feel free. This last poem is called Poem Yet to be Written by Bill Campana. After opening a package of ramen, I realized that I didn't have three extra minutes. So I ate that petrified brick of noodles, dry and crunchy. <laughs> and beige. <laughs> then I drink a glass of boiling water, burn my esophagus like a fuse before sprinkling the mysterious contents of the seasoning packet onto a coffee table mirror. Chop those granules into parallel lines with a maxed out credit card. 
Please give it up for Shanti Orion. Yeah, we started this uh, haiku thing. Uh, uh, Jonathan was playing at the the reading uh, intermission that you're reading on Sunday, and it was like it was like hurry up and wait. So I was like haikus. So I, I only had one. So it was. It it, it was a good one. Do it here, huh? You should do it here. You want to hear one haiku? Yes. All right. Do it. All right. Shopping at H and M reminds me the children are bad at sewing. <laughs> You've been listening to On the Block with Andrew Gurevich. The show is produced in Portland, Oregon by Michael DiNapoli at MD Productions. Theme music by Cat Power. Closing music by Jonathan Oak. Look us up on the web at ontheblockradio.com, where you can also link to us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to tune in next week for a brand new episode. Previous episodes can be found on our website. Thanks for listening. Oh, you beautiful kitty kitties. Oh, look at you out there. Creators of art, history, thought. So, (laughs) should I just leave with that, or should I read that? Maybe do that one too, because I mean we're gonna cut them up and see what we get tonight. Oh, that's true. Yeah, maybe if I read something different, it's better. I'll send you all this tape, and so you have it. Okay, cool. Comfort food on two tongues. His father must have been proud when Salvador published his first novel, erasing any doubts that might still linger above his head about uprooting his family from the soil where they were sown so many seasons before harvest. But he must have been surprised to open the first page and find the book dedicated to Salvador's potato. Blame their native language for leaving the only delineation between words like father and potato, hinged upon a single slant of an accent, lingering above the second A of papa. Fortunately, I write in English, where accents are unnecessary. There are no English words that require an accent. I don't miss them. I don't wonder if they wonder about me. I don't care if they remember my birthdays. Fortunately, I write in English, where the differences are more pronounced, where the difference between father and potato is that I know potatoes. I grew up with potatoes. My childhood was filled with bountiful memories of potatoes.